Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 382. In this episode, I'm going to take a look at an essay by Albert J. Nock, the famous essay, Isaiah's Job. And those of you who have read my book, Real Descent, will find that familiar. This is a talk I gave in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, in, I guess it was May of 2012. And this was right on the eve of, it, it may have been the GOP convention in Oklahoma. I'm sorry, it's just been so long, I don't remember the exact thing, but it was important for Ron Paul supporters. So I went down, we had an event, Jordan Page was there, we have had him on the show, Jason Rink was there, and we all spoke, or the two of us spoke, and Jordan sang. And we had, I would say, easily 250 people there. It was a wonderful crowd of people. And it wasn't the whole talk that was devoted to Isaiah's job, but it was a good chunk of it. And this is an essay that Ron Paul was very fond of, involving the question of how to, how to attract people who believe in freedom. Do you attract them by trying to tailor your message to what they want to hear or watering it down to try to broaden the appeal? Or do you just say what you believe? Do you just tell the truth, come what may? Which way are you more likely to reach those people out there who are waiting to hear that message? So I took that on in this talk in Oklahoma City. I, I really like this particular talk, as a matter of fact. And if you enjoy it, then it's a nice little taste of Real Descent. Now, Real Descent is not just a book with, you know, cutesy little speeches in it. I mean, it's, it's a lot of material you can use in debates. There's a whole section in it of all the refutations I've done of opponents of the freedom message. And so you can glean a lot from that in terms of uh, material to be used in debates that you yourself have. Either way, I hope you enjoy it. hope you'll check out that book. Or it's called Real Descent, A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. And you can check it out at realdescent.com. And of course, as always, you can, if you have not already, you can get a free copy of the audiobook version with me reading it via the offer available through tomwoodsaudio.com. The show notes page for today is tomwoods.com slash 382. Here we go. So I want you guys to give a warm welcome for Dr. Tom Woods. Well, thank you guys very much. Thank you very, very much for that. And this is before I tell you that I'm an Oklahoman by marriage. Yeah. We're married here just about 10 years ago in a small, at a small chapel in Bethany. And now that we live in Topeka, Kansas, it's sort of drivable to come here and, and visit my wife's family. So I'm glad to be among you all and feel like I'm at least halfway Oklahoman. I, I want to point out that I have a special guest here with me tonight, and it's the first time she's ever taken a road trip with me to go on one of my speeches. My, my eldest daughter, almost but not quite nine years old, Regina Woods, sitting here in the front. All right, now some of you who have YouTube You've probably already heard this, but now that I got her sitting in the room, how can I not regale you with a couple of quick Regina stories, okay? So this is a kid who, she, when she's seven years old, the school decides to give her little women to read because they feel like, all right, she's such a smarty pants. See what you do with this one, smarty pants. It's 50 gazillion pages long. So she reads the whole thing, you know, passes all the tests and whatever, and at that point begins to wonder, well, look, if I can read little women, how come dad won't let me read his books? How hard could they be? I mean, how hard could Meltdown be next to Little Women, for heaven's sake? But my favorite story in, of, of, of Regina involves her talking to a friend of hers almost two years ago, and they were talking about some old 19th century story involving penny candy. And her friend was saying, well, this is a silly story because we all know a penny doesn't buy anything anymore. And Regina said, thanks to the Fed. <laughs> And then in 2008, so she's only five. In 2008, I had a book come out I co-authored with a guy named Kevin Gutzman. We had a book called Who Killed the Constitution? And Regina wanted to know, she, she very solemnly asked me, 
Daddy, who killed the Constitution? And then I said, well, it's kind of complicated. A lot of people were involved. And, and then she looked at me with sort of panicked look. She said, was it John McCain? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so she's, she was picking up things that were being said in the household. So anyway, a big hand for her. I mean, come on. <laughs> Woo! Very glad. She, and, and for her, the prospect of, of meeting Jordan Page, which is so exciting. So all these things are happening in one glorious evening. And again, I'm so, I mean, really, I'm so glad that you guys came out like this. I mean, you have got to be Ron Paul people if you say to yourself, you know, it's a Friday night, and I think I'll head over to the casino and listen to a speech. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we need more people in the world like this. All right, look, let me cut to the chase here. I think we all know what's going on here. The establishment likes elections that it can't lose. That's what it likes. It likes Dole versus Clinton, for example. See, that was the year that I finally said, I'm just not doing this anymore. I refuse to get excited over Dole versus Clinton. They can't lose that one. Now, I wasn't always so astute. Four years earlier, in 1992, I was 20 years old, Yes, if you're doing the math, I'm turning 40 this year. I don't want to talk about that. Anyway, 1992, I was, the vi I, was I, I was on my way to becoming the vice president of the Harvard College Republicans, which is, of course, a group of like three people. <laughs> so it's easy to be the vice president. You've got a president, a vice president, and a treasurer. That's pretty much the whole thing. Nobody bothers to keep the minutes, so need, no need for a secretary. So there I was, 1992. The election results are coming in. Bill Clinton is declared the winner. I had my first beer ever. I mean, talk about a dork. I was 20 years old when I drank my first beer, and it was because I was so sad that that great champion of freedom, George H.W. Bush, had been defeated. I mean, you know, so I'm not saying that we should be contemptuous of people who disagree with us. It takes every, everybody at his own pace figures things out. And I was in the process of figuring things out, but what they want more than anything else is Romney versus Obama. That's what they would love more than anything else, because they can't lose that. So, I mean, Romney, you know, his top donor is Goldman Sachs. And then in 2008, in 2008, Obama got more money from Goldman Sachs than all Republican candidates running for all offices combined. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Wall Street candidate A versus Wall Street candidate B. That's what they like. And we are the people who are shouting stop to that. That's what we're about. That's why we're here. Now, just the other day, just the other day, now, you know, you read the New York Times. Well, I was saying that hypothetically. None of us read the New York Times. Entirely hypothetical. If you were to read the New York Times, they have an economic columnist named Paul Krugman. Uh, uh, are they booing or are they saying Krugman? Uh, I think the former. Well, all the same, you read his column, and he'll say things like, we can't cut a trillion dollars in the first year, as Ron Paul would do. Because what would happen? Well, that would shrink the economy and would throw people out of work. Well, here's what Mitt Romney just said at a town hall in Ohio. He said, I'm not going to cut a trillion dollars in the first year. <laughs> really, Mitt, you don't say. Really? I had no idea. Well, why not? And he says, the reason is taking a trillion dollars, this is his exact words, out of a $15 trillion economy would cause our economy to shrink and would put a lot of people out of work. So he's Paul Krugman, right? He's Paul Krugman. So, yeah, I know, I know, I know. We're supposed to be a guy, you know. Yeah, I know, Obama's a bad guy. I got it, okay? I hear you. I know Obama's a bad guy. But replacing Obama is not an end in itself if you're replacing him with another crummy Keynesian who's got exactly the same views on the economy. I mean, and, and for him to say that cutting a trillion dollars out of the federal budget is taking a trillion dollars out of the economy shows the dangerous and ignorant mentality he has. Because I'll tell you what, what's taking a trillion dollars out of the economy. When the government taxes us a trillion dollars, that takes a trillion dollars out of the economy. All right. Now, however, when I criticize Romney, they will say, you know, you're helping Obama. 
You're helping Obama by criticizing Romney. No, you know what? You know who's done more than anyone else to help Obama? The people who are telling us we need Mitt Romney as the nominee. Those are the people who've done most to help Obama. Now, a letter went out the other day from the head of, I guess, the former Santorum campaign here in Oklahoma. And now let me say a little something here. I just want, in my own defense, for some of you who, you know, not, not everybody watches all my videos on YouTube and all that. I want to assume things. But, but you know, I try to be even-handed and friendly. I try to be friendly when I deal with people on the other side. Unless they start off vicious, then I don't give them the benefit of the doubt and I just smash them. But if I think people are people of goodwill, I try to assume they're of goodwill and be courteous. And so when I'm on shows like I've been on Dennis Prager, I'm on Michael Medved, or uh, you know, a whole bunch of these other sorts of programs, uh, Mike, uh, Dennis Miller and whatever, I don't go on there saying, hey, you guys are all wicked and you should all you know, burn forever. I, I don't do that. I, I go on, I try to be the best ambassador I can possibly be. And now, if it turns ugly, then, you know, I'll get right in there and fight. But I don't go in there thinking, I've got to smash and humiliate and whatever. I want to try to have a meeting of the minds, and at least so that, if, even if I don't succeed, at least they go away thinking, well, those people are, are a class act. You know, okay. However, when there is something evil and vicious said, I am going to point that out, and I am going to respond to that. Bearing in mind that, yes, of course we want to build bridges, yes, but this letter basically said, beware the Ron Paulians tomorrow, because they're trying to take over the party. They're trying to take over, and we can't have that, because these people have all these objectionable views, and we've got a, a fight going on for the soul of our party. And he went on to use the typical sort of warning, now I have to clean this up a little bit because there's a certain young person present, but I mean, there, he sort of warned that, you know, if these Ron Paul people take over, then before you know it, call girls are going to be selling heroin at your kid's school, so you better watch out, right? It's the usual sort of, you know, I mean, just awful, right? Ridiculous nonsense, right? From people who are, by the way, supposed to believe in decentralized government and the Tenth Amendment, except when it's issues that, you know, they're just not comfortable with, they want the federal government intervening. I mean, you will look in vain for consistency in principle among such people. So what I want to do is I want to go down the list of things in, that I see in Ron Paul and, see, and try and find what's so bad about this guy that he'd be so scary to people who are supposed to believe. Oh, they give speeches about low taxes, and they give speeches about the debt, and oh, it's hanging over our kids and grandkids, and oh, we've got to cut spending, and oh, my gosh, the education department is terrible, and whatever. All these people give these, these speeches, but when push comes to shove, when somebody comes along and says, I'm actually going to do what you people pretend to do, it's like Dracula has come onto the scene. They're reaching for their crucifixes and whatever. Apparently the magic word tonight was crucifix. <laughs> All right, so here are things, in other words, they can't overlook things they disagree with in Ron Paul, like two or three things. But here's what they can, apparently they can overlook, in Mitt Romney. So, for example, TARP, the freaking bailouts, right? The guy supports the bailouts. This is like the key Tea Party issue. That was the thing that got the Tea Party going. Now they're sort of saying, well, you know, hey, nobody's perfect. <laughs> what? Nobody's perfect? Like, that's how you view TARP? So, in other words, it's the same policy Obama supported. So, once again, it's Wall Street A or Wall Street B. And there are people who think there's something wrong with us because we're not getting on board with Wall Street B. And I, I, by the way, I'd say he's more like Wall Street D minus, but I'm just using A and B. All right, then what about education? They're all against federal involvement in education. The local school should be run by local parents. All right. Well, Mitt is a big supporter of No Child Left Behind. He's not going to shut down the education department. He says he's going to make it a whole lot smaller. And you know what that means? It's going to get a whole lot bigger, right? Like, we know what these phony baloney people mean. Where were Mitt Romney's predictions of the financial crisis? Anybody know of them? Because I'd love to look them up. No, nothing, of course, nothing. Whereas with Ron Paul, you got him on the House floor in 2001 saying the Fed blew up this dot-com bubble and that burst and wrecked a lot of people. And now they're blowing up a real estate bubble and that's going to burst and ruin a lot of people as well. He said that in 2001. 
It happened. It came to fruition in 2008. Who was ta I mean, who, who beat him on that? Who was earlier than 2001 on that? Yeah, Paul Krugman in 2005 said, you know, I think housing is kind of heating up. But in 2001 and 2002, he was saying the Fed should heat up housing. Well, yeah, no wonder he predicted it. He called for it. That's pretty easy. So here you've got a guy who is so smart. I mean, this, with Ron Paul, you're dealing with a guy who can tell the future. And these people are going, nah, nah, I'd rather have Romney. Nah, I want some guy who speaks to me like I'm a seven-year-old. I want a guy who, when he wins in New Hampshire, he reads his speech not from his heart, but from a teleprompter. That's what I want. I want a guy who, if I opened up his head, I think there's at least a 30% chance I'd see circuitry and wiring in there. That's what I want. I want a guy who inspires no one. Now, here's a friend of mine, in, well-placed in Washington, sent me this email the other day. I can't tell you who it is, but he's well-placed. And he says, I have a serious, straightforward question. Have you ever seen a Mitt Romney bumper sticker? And he says, I never have. This guy literally has done nothing but run for president since 2007, and in all those years, in both states that this guy has lived in, I honestly has ne have never seen a bumper sticker, a t-shirt, or a yard sign for Romney. The only place you see any Romney, Romney paraphernalia at all is at staged political events or primary delegate events. Maybe my experience is unique, but I doubt it. And he goes on. Contrast this with ubiquitous Ron Paul shirts, hoodies, bracelets, signs, banners, etc., often homemade and quite creative. And finally, he says, Mitt Romney is a terrible politician, a terrible campaigner, and a terrible speaker. He engenders no enthusiasm, loyalty, or interest anywhere. Wow. Well, that's a pretty <laughs> straightforward view. Whereas not only does Ron Paul inspire people, I mean, look at the crowds, but he inspires them to read political philosophers from the 19th century, and he inspires them to read thousand-page economic treatises. These, ki these kids' own parents can't get them to do this. Their professors can't get them to do this. And this guy, who everybody, nothing but hostility toward this guy, he just stands his ground, tells it like it is, and they say, yeah, yeah, I, whatever this guy tells me, he wants me to read a 900-page book, done. <laughs> Unbelievable. Nah, we don't want that guy. Nah. I want Romney. How about taxes? Never supported a tax increase, right? And never will. Then we got a guy, we got Mitt Romney, who thinks Ben Bernanke and the Federal Reserve are doing a super job. It's just super. I have no complaint with the Fed. So once again, Wall Street A, Wall Street B. Does Obama have any complaint with the Fed? Nope. But, and apparently, according, at least, there is at least a sliver, at least a sliver, I don't want to smear everybody, at least a smith sliver of, of the Oklahoma GOP that apparently thinks it's just not that big an issue. Nah, Fed's not a big issue. Sure, it blew up the biggest financial bubble in the history of mankind, but you know what? We need it for stability. Yeah. <laughs> all right, but foreign policy, like you're all thinking, all right, these are easy, but what about foreign policy, right? Well, I have dealt with this quite a bit. Um, I've, let's see, where have I... TomWoods.com slash war, I think I've done some stuff on this. But just to make a long story short, there is, no, there is no conservative in his right mind ever that would have said, it is conservative to bring the military to Afghanistan and try to instill, you know, basically enlightenment 18th century European values into this society. There is nothing conservative about that whatsoever. But moreover, think about this Iraq war that we're all supposed to support because that helps the U.S., that helps Israel. Does it really? I mean, look at the results of that. I mean, not only, I mean, we all know it was based on propaganda. Like a seven-year-old with an internet connection knows that. I mean, don't insult, if the Soviet Union had peddled that propaganda, these people in the GOP would have been screaming bloody murder. But if it's George W. Bush, they sign right on. Every Pentagon press release is like holy scripture. I don't believe anything the federal government's telling me, but it's war propaganda, A-OK. -okay. Not gonna question any of that. But look at the results of it. Now, instead of having a totally contained, as Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice both admitted, in quotations that have since fallen down the Orwellian memory hole, Hussein was totally contained, a threat to nobody, a two-bit nobody, a secular dictator. 
Now they have an Islamic regime whose constitution pledges fidelity of all their laws to the Koran, and it's a Shiite regime friendly with Iran, and that's supposed to be a better outcome. That's great. Now we're much safer. Now you raise that with them and they say, well, who could have predicted that? Well, you know, there's a certain guy running for president who predicted exactly that. This is exactly what's going to happen with your war. You're going to be a trillion dollars poorer. You're going to have all this death and destruction. And now, as it turns out, we've got an epidemic of suicide throughout the military, all kinds of casualties. And the result is going to be a worse situation than you started with. And meanwhile, the best they can come up with at Free Republic, so-called, is, well, who could have predicted that? Any conservative worth his salt predicted that is the answer to that question. In a way, it's like, you know, I mean, maybe you have the same feeling I do. It's so freaking obvious that Ron Paul is like a statesman for the ages, and he's being put up against these moral and intellectual pygmies like Tim Pawlenty, and people can't see the difference? Like, you wonder, is it me? So, to console you, I want to introduce you to my favorite character in all of world literature, Wonko the Sane. Oh, uh, hum, oh, I don't know who that is. You should read Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series. How many other dorks are in this room? Come on, identify yourselves. All right, yeah. All right, well, book number four, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, I believe that's the one. He introduces a character named Wonko the Sane. Wonko the Sane stays inside one enclosure. He believes the entire world is a giant insane asylum. And so he says, my little building, my little enclosure here is, is outside the asylum. People in the rest of the world are inside the asylum. And to some degree, I feel like Wonko the Sane half the time. Like, for, because, for example, the fact that it's taken so long for the Federal Reserve to become an issue when you look at every up and down we've had in the 20th century. You look at the Great Depression, you look at these other fluctuations, you look at the 1990s going into 2000, you look at the housing bubble, and it's always preceded by Federal Reserve credit expansion. The stagflation of the 1970s, it's always, always, always that. I mean, in, in 1928 or 27 or 28, the head of the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank of New York said to a couple of other central bankers in Europe, we're about to give a coup de whiskey to the stock market. Yeah, how'd that turn out? Right? I mean, because eventually the stock market sobers up from that. So its fingerprints are on every one of these business cycles, and yet every time people say, gee, what's causing these? What the heck is causing these ups and downs in the economy? What could be similar about all of them? I, mean, I just don't know. I mean, is there, are they all starting in July? Or is it like a half moon? Like what? It's the Fed. I mean, what is the problem? Or, or how about this? Alan Greenspan one of the most disastrous Fed chairman ever. And I mean, that is a coveted prize, right? I mean, a disastrous Fed chairman, it's like a redundancy. But here's a guy, he goes on 60 Minutes, and I don't know if he's talking to Leslie Stahl or Diane Sawyer, I forget who, who it is, but he admit, she plays a clip of him testifying before Congress. You can't understand a word this guy is saying, it's all gibberish. And she says to him, what did that mean? And he basically says, well, you know, he admits that he was blowing smoke to throw Congress off the trail, basically figuring that congressmen don't know anything about the Fed, so you just throw some words around and they'll feel like, oh, okay, well, you know, sorry we asked. <laughs> he even called his own tactic, he called it syntax destruction. <laughs> so he admits on, on national television that I was just blabbering about nothingness to your elected representatives. I'm not an elected representative, I'm some jerk who used to, a former saxophone player, in charge of deciding what interest rates should be. And this doesn't terrify anybody. Wonko the Sane, that's who we all are. We're all Wonko the Sane. And right now, we are outside the asylum in this room right here. <laughs> or the war propaganda. I mean, come on. Everybody in the world knew that the phony baloney war propaganda for the Iraq war was phony baloney war propaganda. And then the argument the neocons make is, but all the other intelligence agencies thought that Saddam had... Yeah, because they're getting their information from the U.S., you dolt. I mean, obviously they all think that. They're getting their information from the same liars, of course. 
But when you think about the human cost of this, and I used to be totally oblivious to this when I was younger, I used to think of U.S. military intervention, I used to think, yeah, this is like an awesome video game I could watch from my house, and yeah, this is great. But then you realize that, especially in a case like this, where these people who are being attacked, they haven't done a thing to us, they couldn't do a thing to us. In Afghanistan, I, the vast majority of these people, if you interview them, they don't even know 9-11 occurred. You ask, they never even heard of this thing. I mean, these are real, these are human beings. These are not, this is not garbage. You can just treat like garbage. And these people who, who dare to call themselves conservative, which was once a dignified name for humane and civilized people, like Russell Kirk, who would never in his worst nightmare have endorsed this type of war propaganda, they just accept this. They lecture us about moral relativism. You libertarians are all moral relativists. You think you can make up your own morality. And yet, when it comes to foreign policy, they are the biggest moral relativists of all. If the U.S. government tells me it's okay, then darn it, it's okay. They must have some inside information or something. But don't even tell me about it. Don't even tell me. I don't even want to hear it. And you wonder, am I the only sane one here? Now, why do we feel this way? The reason is we belong to and we constitute the remnant. Now, Ron Paul speaks about this once in a while, and I want to finish up by explaining what he means. The Remnant is a reference to a great essay by Albert J. Nock, this old right figure from the early, uh, mid, middle part of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century. And Nock wrote this famous essay, beautiful essay, called Isaiah's Job. And now Nock, to my knowledge, was an agnostic. He was not a religious man. But he borrowed Isaiah from the Bible. And he renders the instructions that the Lord gives to Isaiah in sort of modern American vernacular. And I'm going to share this with you now. And as I share it with you, it's going to become clearer and clearer exactly who we are and what our role is. So this is Nock. The Lord commissioned Isaiah to go out and warn the people of the wrath to come. Tell them what a worthless lot they are. He said, tell them what is wrong and why and what is going to happen unless they have a change of heart and straighten up. Don't mince matters. Make it clear that they are positively down to their last chance. Give it to them good and strong and keep on giving it to them. I suppose perhaps I ought to tell you that it won't do any good, the Lord continued in the vernacular of Nock. The official class and their intelligentsia will turn up their noses at you, and the masses will not even listen. They will all keep on in their own ways until they carry everything down to destruction, and you will probably be lucky if you get out with your life. Well, Isaiah had been very willing to take on this job, but when this prospect was explained to him, it put a rather a new face on the situation, and it raised the obvious question, if the enterprise is doomed from the start, if no one's going to listen to me, why even bother? And the Lord said, again in the knock vernacular, you are missing the point. There is a remnant there that you know nothing about. They are obscure, unorganized, inarticulate, each one rubbing along as best he can. They need to be encouraged and braced up because when everything has gone completely to the dogs, they are the ones who will come back and build up a new society. And meanwhile, your preaching will reassure them and keep them hanging on. Your job is to take care of the remnant. So be off now and set about it. Now do you see? In some ways, we are all following in these footsteps. Now, the temptation, which is always there, is to reach as many people as possible by watering the message down. But by doing that, you accomplish nothing and you repel the remnant. You can change minds. That's not ruled out. But it's self-defeating to do so by diluting the message. And now, I conclude this section by reading... What Nock, how Nock describes what Isaiah did, and see if you recognize in this a certain person we all admire. Isaiah preached to the masses only in the sense that he preached publicly. Anyone who liked might listen. Anyone who liked might pass by. He knew that the remnant would listen. He made no specific appeal to mainstream opinion, did not accommodate his message to their measure in any way, and did not care two straws whether they heeded it or not. As, as a modern publisher might put it, he was not worrying about circulation or about advertising. 
Hence, with all such obsessions quite out of the way, he was in a position to do his level best without fear or favor and answerable only to his august boss. And that's what Ron Paul does, and that's who he is. He doesn't say to the public the things they want to hear like, you Americans are the awesomest of the awesome, and the only reason anyone in the world might be unhappy with your government is because of your sheer awesomeness. <laughs> he won't do it. Now, as Jason Rink said, thanks to the Internet, we have a far greater prospect of tracking down the remnant than ever before. On a scale we never thought possible. We can find these people now. They can find us now. And you and I are part of the remnant. And to echo what Jason said, you have to ask yourself, this is not a throwaway line, what is my role? What is my role in the remnant? What am I going to do? And there are a lot of different things you can do. There are a lot of skills you might have that could be put to the service of some worthy group and some worthy venture. And I want to offer to you two action items tonight. Now, one of them I'm afraid you'll find to be self-serving, but anytime I work on something for at least a year, I have to tell people about it. Uh, after, after all the long hours away from the family. I've decided, like, I figured out what my niche is. It was very easy to figure it out because, and this is not just uh, artificial, self-deprecating humor. I'm only good at, like, one or two things. And I'm not just putting myself down, but I really stink at everything. Like, I can't sing. I can't fix anything. My car, I have to, as far as I know, angels make my car run. I have no idea how that works. I get a flat tire, I got to call AAA. I don't know. Like, I don't know. There's a jack? Like, how does this even work? Like, I mean, I'm just hopeless. I was the last guy getting full-serve gas until they just finally stopped doing it. I had to figure it out. Like, I can't do, like, people who are carpenters absolutely blow my mind. Like, these people seem like magicians to me. I, I have no idea how this is done. And that's beautiful, by the way, to have that moment where you really appreciate the division of labor. You appreciate other people. See, uh, other people are doing things that if I had three lifetimes, I couldn't do. So I better focus on the one thing that I can do. One thing I can do is write. I write like crazy. I can't stop myself. I write and write, but also I explain things. This is one thing I'm going to take credit for, is that... Because I was the guy who in high school, whenever there was a basketball player that was at risk of being kicked off the team for academic reasons, they'd send him to Woods. Woods will teach that guy math. And I would sit down with the people on the women's team, the, the, the men's team, and I would teach them the, the math, and they would pass. And the coaches thought, okay, I used to want to make fun of this guy and give him a wedgie. But now I've got I to gotta hand it to him. He's saving my players. Like this, I don't know what he's doing. But basically the way I do it, was just, I thought to myself, when I was trying to understand this crazy stuff, what was the stuff I wish my teacher had said to me from the start so I wouldn't have had to have three hours struggling to figure it out? What were the things I wish, if only the teacher just said this to me from the beginning, I would have gotten it. Well, I just say those things to people, and they say, oh yeah, oh, well my teacher didn't explain it that way. All right, I can explain things. I can write and I can explain things. So what I've been working on is something that I just premiered last month, because I figure not anytime soon are the universities going to stop teaching propaganda, and the high school is going to stop teaching propaganda. So I thought, instead of just whining, hey, the universities are teaching propaganda, that stinks. Do, get off your lazy behind and do something about it. So I thought, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to get on the internet, and I'm just going to teach people U.S. history, the real, actual thing. And I'm going to have friends that I trust teach real European history. And I'm going to have friends that I trust teach real economics. And just go over the heads of these propagandists so that anybody sitting anywhere in the world can just turn it on and bang, it's right there. That's my niche. <laughs> and then you want to ask me a question, you go over to the forums, you ask me a question. And it's great. And it's just great. And you can listen to the stuff in your car. I hate wasting time in my car. I'm on this earth for only so long. I want to learn everything there is to know. I don't have time. Like, I want to learn something all the time. Here you go. So my first action item is a personal favor to me. I am asking you to pay a visit to my new site, libertyclassroom.com. The second action item is a personal one for you, and it amplifies Jason's message. You have got to figure out what your niche is, because we don't have room for spectators in this. Because we are the remnant. We are, by definition, a minority. So that means each one of us has to have an effect disproportionate to the number one. 
that we represent. And so we, what do we need? We need animators, we need graphic designers, we need writers, journalists, bloggers, activists, organizers, delegates, all these different things, and more, many other things, people who can just do practical things with their hands. Well, whatever, there's always something. And there are organizations that need help and that are doing worthy things. The Tenth Amendment Center, the Foundation for a Free Society, Jason Rink is involved in, all these different groups, they all need help. And we've got the talents. I mean, good grief, the Ron Paul movement has got so much talent, so many weird and bizarre talents, too. It's incredible. We've got to use them. Think of how we can use them. But the one thing we will not do is stop fighting because a system that yields us a choice between, which is what they want, they want a choice between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney saying that these two are the best of the best of America. That's an insult to you, it's an insult to me, and it's an insult to the great patriots who served this country in the past. So let us go out there not water ourselves down. Now, that's true. Sometimes you, you think of ways to appeal to people. You don't immediately go after the one thing you disagree on. You have, to be, you have to have tact. You have to be clever. That's true. But ultimately, you can't sell out. We've got to find the remnant. We've got to encourage them. We've got to educate them. We've got to inspire them. We've got to build them up. We've got to increase their numbers. For that day, whenever in the future it may be that victory is at last ours, when the, propaganda, the propagandists in this country have been refuted, the peddlers of death have been defeated, the foes of the republic have been disgraced, and her champions finally embraced and honored, then, then Isaiah's job will truly be done. Let us get to work, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And that is the show for today. I will link to Real Descent on the show notes page. I will also link to the, uh, the Isaiah's Job essay, the essay by Albert J. Nock. That is, if I can find it online, by the way. I haven't looked yet. I don't know that it's readily available. I'm pretty sure it is. Pretty sure it is readily available online. And if it is, I will be linking to that as well at tomwoods.com slash 382. If you are enjoying the show, remember, please consider supporting the show. And you get all kinds of free goodies, including, as a matter of fact, one of your bonuses you get is the Kindle edition of Real Descent. So if you like the show, please consider helping me out over at supportinglisteners.com. All kinds of goodies for you over there. So please check them out, and we'll see you tomorrow. The Tom Woods Show.